Now, because of the exponential growth of information technology, uh, the paradigm shift rate, the rate of progress is getting faster and faster. The printing press took centuries to be adopted. The telephone, which I'm showing here, uh, took 50 years to be adopted by a quarter of the U.S. population. The cell phone did that in seven years. And think about recent paradigms. Just three years ago, most people didn't use social networks, wikis, blogs, let alone tweets. So the pace of change is getting faster and faster. And here I illustrate the difference between a linear and an exponential progression. This is a linear scale, not a logarithmic one. But you can see that they look the same for a while. And that's why linear growth and exponential growth are very often confused with one another. And there's another important factor to take into consideration, which is our intuition, which is actually hardwired in our brains, about the future is not exponential, it's linear. When we walked through the savanna a thousand years ago and we saw animals coming at us, we made linear projections about where that animal would be and what to do about it, and that worked just fine, and that became hardwired in our brains. But the actual pace of progress in information technology is exponential. And this is really the key reason why my projections of the future seem daunting to people and differ from others. And people say, well, Kurzweil underestimates the complexity of making progress in a particular field, and that's not the case. I've been working in information technology for 50 years, and I have a good appreciation of the complexity of these challenges. The difference is in the amount of progress that I anticipate based on these exponential projections. I saw the internet doubling every year. It was called the ARPANET at that time in the 1980s and projected a world wide web that would connect hundreds of millions of people emerging in the mid to late 1990s based on this exponential projection. And people thought that was ridiculous when the entire American defense budget could only tie together uh, a couple thousand scientists in a year. But it happened right on schedule because of the power of exponential growth. And another objection to my thesis is, well, Kurzweil takes these exponentials and projects them out, and we all know exponential growth can't go on forever. Uh, if you have two rabbits in Australia, they become four rabbits, and eight rabbits, 16 rabbits. But finally, that exponential growth hits a wall when the rabbits eat up all the foliage. And indeed, a particular paradigm that brings exponential growth to an information technology, like, for example, Moore's Law in semiconductors, uh, will run out of resources at some point. But what happens then is it creates research pressure to create the next paradigm. And Moore's Law, in fact, is a good example. That was not the first paradigm to bring exponential growth to computing. It was the fifth paradigm. The exponential growth of computing started decades before Gordon Moore was even born. And there were, there were several different paradigms, and I'll show you that in a moment. So as we look at a particular type of technology, we see little ripples of different S-curves as different paradigms kick in. Now, this is a very powerful graph. I put here computers going back to the 1890 American census through five different paradigms. This is an exp a logarithmic scale. So as you go up this, the graph, we're multiplying the power of computers per dollar. Uh, in fact, every level on this graph is 10,000 times greater than the level below it. So the progress is sort of squashed. There's actually trillions-fold increase in the amount of computation you get per dollar represented on this graph. But, and this goes through five different paradigms. The third one, for example, was vacuum tubes. They were shrinking the vacuum tubes, making them smaller and smaller each year to keep this exponential growth going. That finally hit a wall. They got to a point where they couldn't shrink the vacuum tube anymore and keep the vacuum. And that was the end of the shrinking of vacuum tubes. It was not the end of the exponential growth of computing. It just went to another paradigm, to transistors, and finally to several decades of Moore's Law. And that's going to come to an end around 2022. Gordon Moore originally said 2002. Uh, at that point, we'll go to the sixth paradigm, three-dimensional molecular computing. But the most important thing about this graph is look at how smooth the progression this is. Look at how predictable it is. This had, there was absolutely no effect from events like the Great Depression, World War I, World War II, the Cold War, and a lot of other things that happened in the 20th century. People say, well, the current economic downturn, isn't that slowing down progress? Absolutely not. Uh, none of the recessions, nor the Great Depression, had any effect on this graph or any other graph 
as we look at the exponential growth of these information technologies. It's a very smooth, inexorable projection. That doesn't mean the future is completely predictable. The power of these technologies, I believe, is predictable. But what we do with them, whether we apply them to overcoming our human problems or create new problems, uh, that's a story still to be told. But the power of these technologies will be there. And here, look at the average price of a transistor. You could buy one transistor for a dollar in 1968. You can buy a billion for a dollar today. Uh, and, but again, look at how smooth a progression this is. This looks like it's uh, some government-mandated program or a tabletop physics experiment, but this is actually a measure of the invention, the creativity, the innovation, the competition of millions of people around the world. You would think it would be a very erratic curve. Look at how predictable a progression this is. And as we've made the transistors cheaper, they're actually better, they're faster, and the cost of a transistor cycle has come down by half every year. That's a 50% deflation rate in electronics, but it turns out to be true of every form of information technology, including health and medicine, biology. I mean, take AIDS drugs. That's an information technology. It cost $30,000 per patient per year 15 years ago and didn't work very well. Now, in sub-Saharan Africa, it's $100 per patient per year and actually works quite well and people are getting them. Uh, these technologies come down in cost by half every year. And this is not just true of the electronic gadgets you carry around. It's true of every form of information technology. So at first, technologies are very expensive. Consider mobile phones. You know, if somebody took out a mobile phone in a movie 15 years ago, that was a signal that this person was very powerful and wealthy. Today, two, two people out of three, four billion out of the six billion people have mobile phones and they actually work a lot better and they do you know, many dozens of things, according to the Apple ads, they do 65,000 things, uh, and they're very inexpensive. Uh, so ultimately, these technologies, particularly now that health and medicine is an information technology, which it wasn't, which was not the case just recently, uh, these technologies will become very inexpensive ultimately.